Welcome back. We're going to go ahead and get started. And I know there are a few people in the lobby still trying to get their uh, travel reimbursements. So I'm going to go ahead, Soya, um, and uh, give our get ourselves started. We have some some journalists, student journalists, and a, a couple of questions from um, journalists who have arrived. Um, so can we go ahead and, and start with that, Soya? Is that all right? And I'm going to ask for one question, very brief question. And you can direct it to a, a participant or to President Carter. Sorry, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry, we're not taking any p uh, questions about uh, American politics, really. Um, it, it, this is a human rights forum for a global forum. Do you have a question about? Uh, yes, can, can President Carter speak to the people who have, are disengaged from our democracy now because global human rights are very endangered? So you're worried about the American voters who are disengaged? Yeah. Yes, because it affects everybody. It affects global human rights, and we have a lot of people who are disengaged now. We had a forum last night with me and Bernie Sanders, and that was one of the things we discussed was when people feel that they are disadvantaged, say economically or with jobs or with education or health care, they also feel disadvantaged from equal participation in a democracy. Now, our political process in America is dominated by money. You can't hope to get the Democratic or Republican nomination without being able to raise $200 million at least from special interest groups from Wall Street and from the pharmaceutical companies and energy companies and, and things like that. And so this means that uh, average citizens, like I used to be, uh, can't anymore become engaged in politics. And, and then after the election's over, of course, the incumbent leaders who've just been elected with a lot of money feel obligated to the people that gave them all that, uh, all those contributions. So s since, I'd say since I went out of office, not, that, not because that was a turning point, but uh, the, the incumbent politicians have rewarded the rich people by changing the tax laws and other laws to give them more and more advantage. So the disparity in wealth in America has gone up tremendously. And that has resulted not only in a decrease in the, ability, in the ability of people to participate in politics, but also to get justice. I, I mentioned last night that when, when I left the White House, there were about one out of a thousand people in prison. Now there are seven times as many. For every one person in prison when I left the White House, there are now seven times as many in prison. So you, you, you have a decrease in commitment or faith in your own uh, status as a citizen, your decrease in uh, confidence in, in your elected public officials, a decrease in confidence in the system of justice, and a decrease in confidence in democracy. And when it happens in the United States, it sends a devastating wave of influence, negative influence, to the rest of the world. Thank you for your question. Can you introduce yourself and ask your question? How's my what? Your health and update health. on guinea worm. Okay. Well, my health is fine. I'm going to have an annual physical examination tomorrow, but every month I go over and have a scan of my brain where the, where the uh, cancer was. I haven't had any more trouble with my liver, part of which was removed because of cancer. So I, my health is good. I fell down th the other day in my field and uh, sprained my ankles, my, my wrist. So... That's what I'm wearing a sling. But I'm getting along fine and, and recovering well. And, and, and is, what was the other question? Guinea worm update. Oh, guinea worm update. Well, we started out with 3.5 million cases. And so far this year, we've only had three cases confirmed. And all of those are in Chad. All of those in the, in the country of Chad. And 
last year we had guinea worm cases in Ethiopia and in Mali and in South Sudan. This year we haven't had any cases in those three countries so far. But we've got a long way to go in this year. But we're making good progress. Thank you. How many questions are we going to have? How many more? Yeah. So we have a student journalism. journalism. You don't have to ask me all the questions, by the way. Yeah. Go ahead. Introduce ahead. yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, I'm Kato Kelly, a student journalist representing Holy Innocence Episcopal School here in Atlanta. Um, President Carter, no. what advice would you give to encouraging high school students to embrace increasing awareness and engage uh, in global human rights issues? Well, I would say that when you're in high school or college, you have the greatest degree of freedom in your life. After you graduate, you're going to have obligations. You know, you, if you get married, you're going to have obligations to your family. If you get a job at Coca-Cola company, you're going to have to be loyal to Coca-Cola, which I am, by the way, <laughs> and so forth. So, so you have freedom now to make your own decisions. And I would say that the best thing for a young person to do is to try to keep your morals as pure as possible and keep your ambitions high and have complete confidence in yourself or faith in yourself and, and maintain faith you know, also in the uh, traditions and customs and ideals uh, and principles that never do change. Truth, justice, honor and so forth. Always tell the truth if you can. That's a tough one. So that, that's some of my advice very quickly. I've written books about it so you can read my books. I've got 31 books written, so I, you can get one of those. Thank you for the question. Thank you for those questions. We appreciate you being here very much. So now, um, in this concluding session, um, there are a few, th few things we'd like to do. We have a few more speakers. Um, before I hand it back over to Ambassador Peters and President Carter for con concluding remarks. Um, and as soon as um, the staff walk in at 4 o'clock, I want to acknowledge the Carter Center staff who have been so amazing um, to organize this entire conference, but I want to wait till they're, they're all here at four to acknowledge them. So first, I would like to ask Zaib if you would uh, greet us with a story of, of hope. And you have three minutes, please. Three minutes. I am Zaib, I am belong to South Waziristan, Farta. I am Zaib. I belong to South Waziristan FATA, Pakistan. Uh, our uh, um, FATA population is more than 7 million, and our people are facing um, uh, war situation from uh, 35 years, not just for 9-11. Mm, we, uh, over seven, more than 700 schools are destroyed, and over two and a half million people are living uh, as the uh, IDPs, uh, internally displaced, uh, um, as an internally displaced person. Now the question is this, that uh, uh, our uh, government is claimed that uh, they are by uh, army operation, they clear the area from Taliban, and now the area is clear and safe for people. But uh, um, I visited uh, last month in April, there were not such a situation like they said. If uh, they were true, so why they didn't um, uh, give access to international and national media, that they check the area and they check the situation. So my request is to, uh, to you and our representative that uh, they are um, talk to the government because there are more uh, violation of uh, human rights in that area that is close for um, journalists, for uh, media, so it's better if uh, you are um, pressure that government give access to the uh, journalists to visit that area and see the situation on their own eyes. And number two, there is no permission to NGOs to work in that area. Just two or three uh, NGOs are working there, but the work is so, um, so much. And uh, this is also, uh, I think, uh, you can uh, talk with the government of Pakistan. 
the um, there is and one other issue that uh, farta is um, uh, farta has no representative women representative in pakistan uh, parliament there is only one woman um, parliamentarian uh, she present over more than three and a half million women so it's not justice that uh, <laughs> Three and a half million women are represented by one woman. So this is uh, the forum that we are raised over vice. And um, in last, I will say that this is um, the great platform for us. And uh, uh, President Carter is aspiration, expression, and courage, strength for us. And we are very thankful to you that you provide us fearless uh, platform and we discuss every issue fearlessly. Thank you so much. And uh, Ruth Ann Buffalo. Hi, President Carter. Um, I'd like to ask my elders in the room to please excuse me. Um, it's an honor to be here and to speak before you and I wanted to greet you in my native traditional tribal language. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very, it's an honor to be here and I wanted to uh, acknowledge my ancestors and by greeting you in our traditional language. Um, like many of you in the room, we are all survivors and have overcome diff difficult obstacles um, throughout our history. Um, so I wanted to touch on two things today. Um, my name is Ruth Anna Buffalo. I am a member of the three affiliated tribes, which is from, uh, I'm from Mandaree, North Dakota, uh, which is located on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. Um, <clears throat> I am also named after my grandmother Ruth um, and her best friend Anna and both of, uh, both of these wonderful ladies were community health workers um, in our tribal uh, community of Mandaree. Um, so with that I want to share that we are facing a huge um, health professional shortage in the state of North Dakota but even more so in our rural tribal areas. Um, so I wanted to mention that we all know that poor health is a result of poor policy. Um, I recently ran for office. I ran alongside two of my colleagues, um, Chase Ironize for Congress and Marlo Hunt Bobrun for Public Service Commission. The three of us are uh, Native Americans. Um, I'm from Three Affiliated and they are from Standing Rock. So we had made history um, not only in North Dakota, but in the entire United States, um, being the first three Native Americans to run in a statewide race. We ran unsuccessfully, but we're still pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps, so to speak, and we're gonna run again, and we're committed to helping others uh, in the Native American community to run for office. Um, I wanted to touch on, thank you. I wanted to also touch on the lines of hope um, and as a legal observer, um, observing the militarized police force uh, within our home st state of North Dakota at Standing Rock um, this past year was definitely an eye opener. Um, I have a public health background in seeing the risk that communities face in uh, contamination of air, water, and land uh, will ultimately affect the health of all of our communities. Um, so my role with Standing Rock was to provide assistance um, in working with the ACLU of North Dakota. Currently, I am um, assisting Honor the Earth, and they also send their, their gratitude um, to you, Mr. President. Um, but right now, we're working on repairing the uh, relationships within our state of North Dakota. Um, there is a huge rift that exists between um, our communities as a result of the um, pipeline in specifically seeing the use of militarized force used by Morton County and others. Um, and it's disheartening to, to this day to know that the use of militarized force um, and the use of excessive force and non-lethal weapons um, to protect economic interests um, that say, 
you know, profit is more of value than humans, uh, which is not right. Um, and so my concern lies in uh, Martin County and others who are taking their model of excessive force um, and presenting to other law enforcement agencies throughout the United States. Um, and that's very concerning because we need to come together, reach across the table, and um, find peaceful ways of resolution. Madzigirads, thank you. And I've got Zama and then Michael um, and then Esther and Rosna and then we're done with comments. Zama? Thank you. Um, thank you to everybody and thank you to the Carter Center for inviting the Legal Resources Center from South Africa. Um, I just want to reflect a bit on everything that's happened. I've been quiet for, a few, for three days but I've been uh, most thankful to everybody and uh, for all the individual discussions that we've had and in the groups. Um, I just want to also say that my first point is that it's important that we engage on a, in a genuine way and in a genuine, um, in a genuine manner. It's important that we create genuine networks uh, from this establishment. Let this not just be another forum where we go back and we don't report to the communities and to everybody that has sent us here, but we also engage genuinely with each other and realize that the business cards, we're not just going to drop off when we get to the airport. And also, just to second what Khalid said, it's important that we engage with the youth. Um, not everybody's going to be where they are in the next few years. And it's important that we pass on the information that we've learned over the years. And I've been, uh, I've been humbled by the stories that people have shared and also the work that people have done in places where there are no resources. So um, with that, it's also important that we acknowledge our privileges in every situation and in every encounter that we come across, such as the sitting. It's important that we acknowledge our privilege, whether it's donors or funding or um, academia or whatever. Um, in every situation, I think it's important to, to acknowledge our privileges. And also to realize that the, what our discussions is a that this discussion we're having, I'm sorry, I'm shaking, um, is a global phenomenon. Um, in South Africa, we are starting to see the signs of everything that people have discussed. We are having amendments of our nonprofit act. We are seeing um, massacres, uh, the limitation of the right to protest with the Marikana massacre, we're seeing people who are part of the fees must fall, uh, protests being detained for six months, bail be being denied. We are seeing um, organizations such as the Legal Resources Center and other organizations being discredited, whereas we've been in these spaces since 1979. Um, so finally, before I get cut, <laughs> um, I think it's important to realize that we need to come together, north and south, in really acknowledge that with, under this topic, we are all equal. There is nobody with a bigger or a less crisis, but this is a crisis that affects one. South Africa's crisis affects Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's crisis affects the US. Um, and, oh, sorry, one more thing. It would be unfair for me to say, not say this, that we need to also allow the space for movements and to not uh, always accept, accept that we are the solution. Uh, as the NGO sector, but to realize that as time changes, we also need to adapt with what the world is going on and we need to actually create the space for movements and have movements maybe dictate to us what needs to happen and what we need to be, dis to dis to be discussing and vice versa. Thank you very much. We spoke a lot about movements and, and making sure that those connections are made. I think that's very, very important. And Michael O'Reilly from Amnesty International. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> and thank you, President Carter and Mrs. Carter um, for convening this important gathering. This room is filled with some of the bravest people I know. The question from uh, from the high school journalist with us, uh, got me thinking about, about my own origins and when I first became aware of human rights, and that was when I was a teenager in high school, and the president of my country announced that the protection of human rights was going to be core to his administration. 
to your administration, President Carter. Uh, that awakening uh, ignited in me so many things that led me on a path that brought me to my life's work, and for that, I will be forever grateful to you. Uh, over the course of these four days, <clears throat> it has been really affirming to me to hear many of, of my colleagues uh, at the conference talk about how Amnesty International collaborated with them in helping to advance human rights in their country. Uh, at the beginning of this conference, uh, when we were doing our introductions, I said that I believe that change comes best from within. And I believe that your stories, your recounting the struggles, and uh, has proven that to me all the more. And the role of Amnesty International is to be a partner to you. As we discussed this morning, there is an important role for international bodies to play in advancing uh, change in the world. And, and I think that Andrew got an earful of recommendations on that uh, earlier today from the folks in this room. But international bodies don't have the power. And, and I think we heard that from Andrew. Um, it's the people who have the power. And it's my colleagues in this room who know that very, very well. And the colleagues in this room are the leaders within their countries who will help bring about that change. I wanted to make sure that you all are aware that this month Amnesty International is redoubling its efforts for human rights defenders around the world and launching a multi-year campaign to call attention to the new threats that human rights defenders face in many countries, including my own. Uh, the threats, whether they be the traditional forms of intimidation and harassment, or the newer forms and electronic forms of intimidation and harassment. We want to highlight not only the threats, but we want to highlight the work of people like my colleagues in this room, the work and the challenges that they face in bringing about change in their countries. And so to my colleagues, I want to say that we will work with you. We will always work with you. And if I can end on a, on a note of hope, um, many people know the logo of Amnesty International, which is the candle and barbed wire. Not everybody knows the, the, the slogan that goes along with it. And the reason that Amnesty's logo is a candle comes from an old proverb that says, it is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And I feel like the candle power in this room can ignite the sun and shine a spotlight that will clearly lead us to justice. So thank you. Um, uh, and that reminds me of Emily's question. I've been waiting for her to come back. But uh, she had asked you a question earlier that we haven't got to yet, President Carter, about if you have a comment about these um, these laws that are passing in the United States legislatures limiting the right to protest. There are these terrible laws that are being introduced that were mentioned earlier um, that are quite troubling, uh, infringement of the right to protest. Do you have a thought about that? What could be done? First of all, I'm against them. Um, this is, a, I think, a very a public and evident uh, indication of what's going on throughout our country. The tightening up of laws state by state is really derivative from what's happening in Washington with our central government. And uh, it's the same trend that takes place in many of your countries when something happens in Washington, it uh, sends either a good or bad signal to the rest of the world. And that's why we've assembled here, is to get the voices of people from many countries to point out what's happening in your, in your country. And what we need to do here is to let every state legislator and every governor and every member of U.S. Congress and every head of state in the, in the nation, in the world, know what we're talking about today. And that's a very difficult, almost impossible thing for us to do. I'm going, to, I'm going to speak about that in just a few minutes. So I'll try to answer your question a little bit further uh, when I make my closing remarks. Now we're all curious. You can turn <laughs> off your... Turn off your uh, um, okay, uh, a few more speakers. Um, what I, 
just uh, three more speakers, and then we have some time later. But uh, we have time. Um, but you, but while the, the, our speakers are, are speaking, just notice that we have passed out the, the uh, statement that we have worked on together over these days. Um, and um, many, many, many people had input into this statement. We're quite proud of it. Um, so if you have any particular problems with it that you can't live with, please email me. Um, and we will share this. And we want to find a way for all of us to use this statement as a building block for our, our community. Um, so now I'd like to call on Esther, and then Khurshid, and then Rostan, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, for the privilege and honor of being here. And I also want to appreciate um, every other person that's been here. I've learned so much from all of you. Um, six years ago, there was a conflict in my city and my family home um, that we had lived in for almost 35 years was raised to the ground. Um, it was burnt by Muslims that were in my community and that um, was really painful. But I was so grateful to God because we just barely had time to pull my mother out and the rest of my siblings. And in less than an hour, they came and they put the house on fire. And that really hurt me because it was like all my childhood memories were burned. My childhood pictures and everything and for the rest of my family too. It's funny because out of all the burnt uh, items, I only remember my mother's sewing machine. Her sewing machine is so significant because um, it's a table sewing machine. And I, I, we come from a very poor home. And we're so many girls, we're eight girls and two boys. So we never really had new clothes because our elders, all we had was handouts, you know. Uh, the elders will pass to the next and then and so on before it gets to you. But once in a year at Christmas time, my mom would sew us new clothes. So when that incident happened, I sort of felt like, I wasn't gonna have new clothes anymore because that machine was 50 years old. And um, so it was difficult for me dealing with that. And then I met um, Nafisa. In the midst of my pain, I met Nafisa. And we were just talking and Nafisa told me how some Christian youths came and set her house on fire. And we were like having almost the same story so um, through that, I was able to forget, forgive, and release. And um, Nafisa understood very much how much I felt, and vice versa. And um, today, Nafisa, I, we now formed um, Women Without Walls Initiative, which is an interfaith women's group. I'm the president of that organization. Nafisa is the vice president. And together, we have had the chance of reaching out to both Christian and Muslim youths to um, say no to violence, to shed their swords, and embrace peace. And that work has been impactful because um, through the pain we, went, we both went through, um, I believe that God brought beauty out of ashes. Thank you. Khushid Bano. Uh, I'm Khushid Bano from Pakistan. I'm feeling proud and happy uh, there with a great leader and great uh, my friends. Um, I'm working on peace, uh, women leadership, and uh, violence against women. Um, Dear President, I want to raise and uh, highlight the issue of Kashmiri, Kashmirian uh, human rights defender and political activist. They have uh, facing man, uh, two decades almost the very critical position. So I request Mr. Uh, President, uh, please say some words about the issue and policy of Kashmir. Thank you.
And finally, Rostin. So you want to use your earpiece. Rostin? Thank you very much for uh, letting me speak. Mr. President, uh, please allow us to uh, show us all our gratitude to you and uh, also to the Carter Center for allowing us to be present here at this very important forum, which has allowed us to share uh, our own experiences among all of us. That said, I am Rostam Manquet from the uh, DRC. I have a message of hope because, Mr. President, I can assure you that we are going to leave with renewed energies, renewed energies to uh, vanquish fear, to get rid of fear. Indeed, to get rid of fear is something very powerful. That power is the one to get rid of oppressive regime, to make the authors of fear go back, step back. And we have that experience. We have that experience of hope, which I would like to share. In 2010, when two members of our organizations uh, were assassinated, we felt the solidarity of all our colleagues, some of them here present. We led several actions to demand justice in favor of our two colleagues, Floribert, for instance, who was assassinated. And while we were uh, having all these uh, uh, initiatives to put pressure, we were threatened by a general, a highly placed general, very close to the president of the Republic, who spoke on Radio France International to say that he was going to bring to justice anybody who was going to mention his name. And when we learned that, we said, oh, this is a clear threat. We adopted a counter strategy, multiplying actions, giving his name repeatedly. And then the general shut up. He stopped talking and we kept on mentioning him up to this day and he never moved forward with threat. Thank you very much. Okay, now I get to... Um, why do I do this? I get so emotional. I want to thank the staff. Um, Talisha. Ah, it, such an amazing job, very difficult uh, challenges to organize this forum. Uh, many of you have no idea <laughs> how, many, how hard it is. Mo Habib. Um, <laughs> our wonderful interns, Kate, our graduate assistant, Faiza. <laughs> our wonderful intern, Rinsola. Rinsola, where are you? <laughs> and. And Grace, over here. And where's Danielle? Is Danielle here? Danielle's not here, but Danielle. And of course, all of the staff uh, in President Carter's office, in our finance office, in, all, in our public communications office, um, this conference would not be possible. Thank you to the interpreters. Um, and to all of the sound and AV, everyone. Michael Schwartz, our photographer. Lisa Wiley and, and all the event staff. Um, and Jason, did I, where, where's Jason? Jason, because you've become part of the event staff to me. <laughs> Jason Parker, who is your man when it comes to video and the website. I wanted to thank you all. You were wonderful. Everyone here has come to me and s talked about your professionalism and your kindness, so thank you. Now um, I get to turn the program back over to Ambassador Peters. Um, who will then invite President Carter to, to end our meeting. Thank you, Karen. It's been a privilege to be here over the course of the last day and a half and to hear from all of you about the situations in your countries and about what you're doing to protect human rights for all of us, not just your compatriots. 
I um, was particularly moved and cheered by examples from um, Indria and Père Clément and, and Ruth Ann, examples of uh, strategies to um, get out of the box the constraint of thinking in terms of human rights defenders and human rights violators or friends and foes um, to try to co-opt, if I might, um, or to bring out the humanity in representatives of repressive institutions. And I'm thinking about the example uh, that Indria gave about her work with the police and Père Clement's tripartite work that included the uh, mining companies and Ruth Ann's effort to repair the relationships uh, with those who, um, who uh, really trespassed on the human rights of Native Americans and others um, in our own country. So I wanted to say that those efforts, uh, that sort of effort doesn't always succeed. I've been around too long and I'm not naive enough to think that uh, one can always bring the um, opponent into the fold. But I, I hope that all of you will consider strategies like that, at least at first, because when you can, when you can triumph by bringing uh, at least some of your former opponents around, your triumph will last forever. Thank you. Well, I think everyone here has uh, has deep emotional feelings about what's happened to your own lives and in your country and the concerns that you express. And I would repeat what Marianne has just said to thank all of you who who brought your personal stories to this uh, to this group. I was affected by all of your speeches, but I think today to hear from representatives of two countries kind of uh, made me think twice. 39 years ago, I negotiated between Israel and Egypt. They had been at war for perhaps more than a thousand years. In the 25 years before I became president, they had been at war three times. And we were able to bring peace. And because of that, I felt especially close to Israel and especially close to Egypt. Now, because of changing times, which you have uh, discussed, I'm not welcome in either country. Ever since Netanyahu has been in power, he has ordered every member of his cabinet not to speak to me or to anyone who accompanied me to Israel. And I don't feel welcome in Egypt either. And the main reason is because of uh, violation of human rights. And the fact that uh, what the Carter Center stands for on promoting human rights is unacceptable in many parts of the world. In some of your countries, it's uh, unacceptable. I mentioned in my opening remarks that we have uh, an ability to take the individual speeches and to get mutual support and to form kind of a coalition of, or team here which can speak with a stronger voice than individuals can. And we can influence our people back home, as I pointed out to you. And the Carter Center will be a staunch supporter of what you've proposed and advocated the last few days. But that's a very limited sort of thing. It also brings back a memory to me of, I think, three years ago, when we had a similar conference on the abuse of women and girls. And um, we heard from representatives who pointed out the specific ways that uh, this 
horrible human rights violation was taking place almost without consequence and without public knowledge. And um, I was very concerned about how we could spread our influence more broadly. And I decided at that time to write a book about the abuse of women and girls. And um, since then, it sold several hundred thousand copies. And uh, we sent a copy of it to every member of the US Congress. And we sent a copy of it, I think 190 of them, to every head of state in the world. And Karen received replies from about 50 of those heads of state who said they had read the book and knew what our conference had produced and were concerned about it. And I was invited as part of a book tours to appear on every major television channel in America, ABC, NBC, NBC CNN, and so forth. And uh, also to be interviewed by many of the morning shows and things of that kind. I also had a chance to make public speeches just because I had written a book. I spoke to Harvard and Yale and to Princeton about abuse of women on their college campuses and had several thousand students in each case and some of the presidents of the college were on the stage when I spoke. And same thing on the West Coast. I went out to Berkeley and other places there. So I would say that because of this book, I was able to magnify what um, we had learned from, from people like you who came here to talk about abuse of women and girls. And I would say that since then, the world has become much more familiar with that abuse. Now, it's a common knowledge that girl students in American universities are subject to almost constant and almost inevitable abuse before they graduate from college. And uh, it's been pointed out that in the U.S. military, at least year before last, this last date I had, 16,000 cases of sexual abuse took place. And we learned about human trafficking again, or slavery, which exceeds in total volume, and perhaps even its total people, the slavery that we were so deeply concerned about in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. So all of those things have become publicized partially because a former president was able to express himself. I've been um, equally concerned about what you've expressed. And the obvious to us, but maybe not obvious to the rest of the world, trend downward with the abandonment of uh, a commitment to human rights which, as somebody said, is not uh, a result of idealism, but is a result of practical damage to the lives of people who are our neighbors and in our families and ourselves. So I've decided to write another book about uh, what we've discussed the last few days. And uh, as I did three years ago, I'm going to ask Karen to select from among you, which will be a difficult job, uh, people who will write down what you think are the most important things that ought to be uh, promulgated from, from this discussion. And, and I'll take a copy of, of your statement with me, which I think is a little bit long. But uh, I, I know I and Karen and others had to be a little bit flexible about what we didn't cut out, but I'll examine it very carefully. And, and I'll try to extract from that um, what I think should go in, in, in the book that will be published. And I'll finish the book this year. And 
I'm not going to concentrate on hope. I'm certainly not going to concentrate on despair. I'm not going to concentrate on anything except, I'm going to use the word faith. As many Christians know, now about is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. But I would say that, that hope and love are not possible without faith. Faith is the foundation of our hope. If we didn't have faith in ourselves and faith in uh, democracy and faith in human rights, uh, faith in justice, faith in our fellow human beings, then there would be not any reason for hope. And so that's what I'm going to do as a result of this conference. And I'll be depending on all of you to help me with that. And uh, I hope you don't mind my changing this, the general subject to faith, because I hope that all of you share my faith in the basic elements of moral and ethical values that were the foundation of the United Nations itself and the foundation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I'm looking upon all of you to be my partner in writing this book. And uh, I'll ask Marianne and, and Karen, if they will, to channel to me uh, ideas from all of you. And we may choose some of your quotations to be uh, in the book verbatim. I won't promise that. It'll have to be my book. But uh, I've already got a contract uh, ready to be signed by Simon and Schuster, who have published uh, 13 other books that I've written. And, and so far, all of those have been very good. In fact, they published their one about a time for action. So that's what I wanted to announce. And to encourage you not to be discouraged about the future, but to have full faith which is a foundation for hope and also love. Thank you. Well, there's nothing more to be done or said, so I want to just thank each and every one of you for the long journeys that you've made to be with us and you will be hearing from us very soon. Travel safely. Thank you. Thank you. I, actually, I want to just say on behalf of here to thank you, Karen. Thank you, President Carter, Mrs. Carter, Marianne Peters. Jordan Ryan, all the Carter Center team. It's been the most moving, extraordinary experience for us, and thank you for making that possible.